but deliver us from evil as we are learning to live without fault finding and suffering. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. For we accept the consciousness of divine perfection with all its power and glory right here, right now, and forever. Amen. And so it is. So be it. Amen. 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 That's right. You can, you can clap for Jesus. Those are Jesus' words. <laughs> and then you may be seated. Um, I, it was interesting because somebody that used to go to church that now shares my meditations on uh, his page. He lives somewhere else. And um, I, I look at some of the things that the people on his page say about my meditations. I had quoted Wayne Dyer last night, and somebody was sending him all these articles about Wayne Dyer's new, like it was like it was some big expose. We're like, yeah, he's new age. So that's not a, A, that's not a secret. B, we don't consider that a negative thing. You know, I answer, I answer to a lot of things. Like, um, I'm still Pentecostal. Uh, this week, well, Friday night we went to see the Lion, the new Lion King, and could, you know I couldn't find any place where it wasn't sold out, so I bought. I found it at North DeKalb. I said, oh, they've got a couple seats at North DeKalb. Let's get that. So that's not that far away. The North DeKalb shows the same. It's, it's, it's an AMC. It shows the same thing they show at Phipps, but it's like half the price in case, you're, in case you want to save some bucks. That's not that far. So I said, we'll go there. So we, so we get there. We're just in time for the movie. And uh, as I show her, she's scanning the whatever the thing is on your phone. She goes, now, you know this one is dubbed in Hindi. With no um, with no subtitles, I said, "What, Hindi?" <laughs> I mean, I said, "I'm I'm assuming there's there must be a large Indian population in that neighborhood." It's just I wasn't expecting that, so I posted a picture of my. Oh yeah, that was me. Wah, wah, wah. And sure enough, when I looked at it, it says it right there, but I didn't even notice that, you know. Yeah, yeah, there was a whole bunch of people. Uh, they didn't speak any, but the point is, when I posted it, several people said, "Well, you're Pentecostal, just, just interpret, <laughs> interpret what they're saying, like speaking in tongues." I said, "Well, I would try that, but I, I actually wanted to hear the voices of the people who were, uh, which, by the way, it's a good movie. It's, it's really cool. The only, th the only thing is, is they, they, they left out the song "He Lives in You," and I think the reason they did it is because, if I remember correctly, that song wasn't in the original animated version. It was in the Broadway show, so I'm assuming they're staying with that template. But it really is cool. They, um, I'm not a big fan of CGI, but the, uh, for this, you'd have to do CGI. And they don't call it CGI. They call it pho photorealistic animation. And you can't tell that those animals aren't real. And some, it, it may be, I don't know how they do it, but it, it's, it's really good. And the new cast, the only person they kept from the old cast is... Uh, James Earl Jones is still the voice of Mufasa because he sounds like God, and uh, uh, but it, it it's definitely good. I thought about even maybe seeing if they'd show it here. Maybe we'll do a group a group viewing of it or something. Is but um, just I want to just make sure it's not in Hindi. Yeah. We did go to we went to a movie somewhere up on eighty five and and didn't realize that the movie was dubbed in Spanish, uh, but they had subtitles in that, so we said ah, let's just stay. So we interpreted. So in this diverse world. Uh, check to make sure that the movie you're going to see is in a language that you actually speak. I know, Hindi. It's like, I'm a, I'm a little rusty on my Hindi. <laughs> I'm sure I took, I took a couple of years of Hindi in high school, but since then. <laughs> so, um, but the point of all that is, it's like I posted something one day about Mark 11, 23, and somebody said, well, you sound word of faith. I said, I am word of faith. I'm all... Somebody says, you're new thought. I'm like, yeah, I am. I, when I Googled, I didn't think I was. Somebody called me a new thought teacher. I said, I certainly am not. And then I Googled it and read what new thought people believe. I thought, oh, well, I guess, I guess that kind of is what I am. But I don't, to me, it's just tomato, tomato. It's all, you know, truth is just truth. Uh, but some people want to make sure that you, you know, give Jesus his proper due. Let me tell you something. Me and Jesus is good. I was just listening to... Uh, what we listen to, the Doobie Brothers singing, Jesus is just all right with me. And then you discovered the Commodores. That's old school, the Jesus is love. They did that in the early 70s. You just now heard that? Back in the like, 70, 71, 72 is when they had the, what they called the Jesus movement, the Jesus revolution. And, and 
a lot of the rock bands did like a, it was very fashionable to do a Jesus song back then. And some of them have held that really good. Say what? Yeah. Commodore's baby. She's a brick. Uh, uh, uh. How? It's classic. Um, okay, let's see. Um, <laughs> Cheryl, it looked like you got put in time out the way you walked in. <laughs> I just had such a flashback because that's what I used to have to do when I, if I was back talking to somebody in the back. Dad, in the middle of the sermon, Dad would say, Jamal, come sit on the front row. <laughs> was Cheryl talking in the back and y'all sent her in the front? Cheryl, what if I told you about this? <laughs> I know, we, did, we definitely did. We definitely did. I think people think we're already in Jekyll Island. Uh, oh, okay, we got some road closings around here. Yeah, driving around here lately with all the construction is a little bit of a, you never know what, um, and some, sh some roads, they'll, open up and then reclose them because there's more construction going on. I don't know where we're going to put everybody, but there, I mean, within a 10-mile radius of my house, there's probably 20 new high-rises going up. And as soon as they, I, everybody must be moving here because as soon as they're finished, like you'll drive down a street and you're like, oh, my God, that building's not there anymore. And the next time you drive down it, like, oh, they've, halfway through with a new building and the next time you drive oh people are living there like people are on the uh, I can't believe how fast they throw up these buildings people will be out I mean it was a vacant lot two weeks ago and now people are on the deck grilling like how is that possible how did they get there that quick it would concern me if they built a building I was going to live in like in you know by last Tuesday I need y'all to take a little more time on this anywho I just like I'm it's fine that they come. I just don't like where we're going to put y'all. I don't know. Where really? Wow. Well, it doesn't look to me like any places are vacant. I saw that you had posted that you had an office. So I love the way they kept that um, that old building part of the on Spring Street. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's crazy. Huh? Why does everybody want to come here? Because they're coming to Metron. Is that why they heard about Metron? And they're like, We've got to move there. <laughs> it took five years for them to discover us, but they're a coming. Uh, yeah, I remember. Um, you know the, those Darlington apartments over there on P Street. I remember back in the late. 60s when um, uh, Atlanta passed a million and they put there because they put the population on the thing I remember that was such a big deal and now it's like was it seven million it's crazy everybody's coming here yeah it's all good with traffic I mean it just is what it is you just kind of have to know how to navigate and what time I mean Sunday morning is fine and uh, when I did uh, Mario Orsini's funeral early, earlier this week. I had the usual people lining up going, oh, if we could just ever hear you preach again. I said, preach every Sunday. Oh, we can't drive to Atlanta. It's like, okay. <laughs> it's like it's like Tibet or something. I like guess the forbidden city. Like, no, it's really a, on Sunday morning. It's okay. Very, very little traffic around. But anyway, you all already know that. Like, yeah, we know we're here. All right. Um, Two weeks from today, don't drive here, because we shan't be here. We will be in Jekyll Island, and I'm and I am ready for it. And every time I see my mom, I'm like, now you know, we're going to be in Jekyll Island first weekend. Like, just need to get that out there, because that's that's going to happen. Uh, it, we're coming up on our uh, seventh meditation weekend. It's going to be the best one yet, and. Uh, we're excited about it. If you're not going, which I hope you are going, but if you're not, don't come here because we will not be here, and I'm assuming the theater knows that. Um, so uh, we'll do the uh, sunset meditation on the third and the sunrise meditation on the fourth, and it's going to be wonderful, and I'm ready for it, and I need it, and uh, there's there's just nothing like 
being around water. E yesterday, I remember there was some place that Eddie and Patrick had posted about that they, a park they were at, and so I called him yesterday. I said, "Where was that place?" And he told me, Sweetwater Creek. So I, that's too big to be. A, that's too. That's too big a body of water to be called a creek. I can't believe they call that a creek. Yes, it really is beautiful, and uh, yeah, it's it's just Lithia Springs. I mean, we were there less than like twenty five minutes. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful um, trails and uh, it's really really nice. And uh, uh oh, what's up? Uh oh, what's up? Yeah, it was it was. Uh, but the, I don't know what that was. Was that a, a mill that used to be there? Right, 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 right. Yeah, I thought so. It just didn't look like that water was deep enough to have been used. But yeah, I guess so. It's really, really cool. But uh, the point is, is just, you know, just sat on a rock for a little bit and just listened to the water. There's, I don't know what it is about bodies of water. I love our mountain meditation, and we'll probably do another one in the fall. But, uh, but even then, we were on the water. I mean, you still want to be close to the, there's, there's just something about it that's uh, magical. And... Um, our outreach this month is uh, the Prevent Child Abuse of America, and it's a if you, on your own time if you want to Google it and see where your money's going. Uh, it's an umbrella organization that covers uh, several different entities that prevent uh, human trafficking and uh, just a, a lot of things. It's very very well vetted um, and respected charity, so we're glad to uh, be contributing to that. And uh, I noticed last night. Dawn posted something really sweet about from Angel Eyes about our contribution last month, so that was cool. And um, our um, oh, by the way, when we get back from Jekyll, uh, Marshall Ruffin will be with us next uh, month, and uh, so that'll be good. August is going to be a great month. Uh, that was uh, Francis had posted about paying it forward for somebody buying school supplies, and uh, so remember to. It's year of living your best life, one nine. And uh, people still seem to be struggling with that hashtag a little bit, but it's okay. We'll, we'll get you we'll get all in the 21st century eventually. <laughs> but the thing about a hashtag is it's like, a, it's like a phone number. You have to have the exact characters the same, and when you do, it makes everything... Everything that's been posted on social media goes to one spot, and it makes it easy to locate. And that's why, if you ever see, if, if you're on Twitter, you see things that are trending, there'll be hashtags with them. That's everything that everybody has said about that thing. All right? And uh, let me see. I think that is everything. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into what we're going to uh, talk about today and then we're going to meditate i've thoroughly enjoyed meditation this uh, month and um it seems like the more we do it the more i believe in it and and the more i see the validity of it uh so let's take it a little bit deeper today and if we're ready for the um the podcastians welcome to the metron live podcast coming to you from beautiful historic midtown atlanta metron people give the podcast people a big hand we're glad that you are here. Again, thank you, Charles McFall, for uh, helping us with this. Uh, this month, we're as I as I like to do. Anytime we do a, a meditation weekend, and we're coming up on our seventh one, coming up the first weekend of August, in conjunction with celebrating the fifth anniversary of Metron. Um, we're going to be in Jekyll Island. Those of you that are listening to the podcast, you don't have to go. To, even if you've never been to Metron, you're welcome to come join us uh, there on the beach. Um, but anytime we do a, a meditation weekend, I like to uh, prepare for it with the teaching. And um, I didn't think this was going to turn into a series, but I, f I realized there was more I wanted to say about it than I, than I knew initially. So I have moved this into a series, and we're titling it Meditation in the Mind of Christ, Healing the Subconscious and Living as Spirits in the Material World. I want to show you a couple of verses of Scripture um, that delineate the difference between spirit and soul. Uh, now, when I was growing up in the Pentecostal church, we didn't really talk about that that much. We, we kind of had the, our theology was kind of like uh, you, 
you have a soul. Like there's a there's a soul in a body, and when you die, the soul leaves the body. But when you really start getting in the New Testament teaching, um, Paul seems to make a delineation between spirit, soul, and body. And then when the faith teaching of the '70s came in, that was paramount in their theology. You know, we used to uh, constantly say, uh, "I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body." And then we then people would start getting technical about what, what is the difference between spirit and soul. Um, let me show you these two verses of Scripture, and then I'll uh, expound a little bit and explain where we're going with this with the subconscious. Uh, this is 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and I'm in the Passion Translation. He says, uh, Now may the God of peace and harmony set you apart, making you completely holy, and may your entire being, spirit, soul, and body. It's the only time in the New Testament the three are mentioned there. Spirit, soul, and body be kept completely flawless in the appearing of our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. The second verse that I want to show you is Hebrews 4.12. I'm going to show it to you in two translations. Uh, it, this is uh, also the, uh, the Passion Translation. It says, For we have the living word of God, which is full of energy, and it pierces more sharply than a two-edged sword. Hey, you guys, come in. Good to see you. I was just talking about this is Betty and this is 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 it Joe? Yeah, Joe. Good to see you. Joe was in the um I was just talking about the funeral a minute ago. Joe was in the army with um Mario, I've known him since nineteen sixty eight and he played the good by the way, you guys sounded great. When you all sang together at the uh the your your harmony and everything is just beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. Um but here this is where in the King James it says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing and center of soul and spirit. Here in the Passion Translation it says it will even penetrate to the very core of our being where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet. It interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secret motives of our hearts. And then I want to show it to you in the um, Amplified Classic, Hebrews 4.12. <clears throat> it says, for the word that God speaks... By the way, he's not talking about the Bible here. Do you understand? He says that he's talking about a living word. Is the Bible the word of God? It contains the word of God. It can connect you to the word of God. But to limit the entirety of the word of God to a collection of books that 60 men, if you go with the Protestant canon, uh, if you were Roman Catholic, you had uh, the the apocrypha was all those 13 books are also included but uh god did speak through those men but that's not the entirety of the word of god david said the heavens declare the glory of god david said i, I go out and, and nature is is the word of god to me um out, there's scriptures that says that that babies will give you the word of god out of the mouth of babes i remember on several occasions when my kids were small they would prophesy to me and not even realize like they, you know, in their little three-year-old mind, they'd say something that was so profound. I'd be like, where, where did you hear that? And then they wouldn't remember what they had just said, you know. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? But um, and anyway, it says here in the Amplified, it says, for the word that God speaks. In other words, there's a, what I'm saying right now is the word of God. Do you understand? It's not the definitive word of God, but it is a part of the word of God. There are probably things that you've said in the last few hours that were a part of the Word of God. For the Word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life or the soul and the immortal spirit and of joints and marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, uh, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Now, this is what I think. Um, if you get too analytical, too cerebral about defining spirit versus soul, or whatever, you're going to get in the weeds. You're, you're going you're gonna to get bogged down in something that um, is not going to produce life for you. Now, uh, there's a, a teacher. I don't know her, but I I'm Facebook friends with her, and I follow her. And she does a lot of teaching about uh, right brain versus left brain. And I agree with all of it. I think, I think that's uh, a very intelligent way to look at what I'm talking about. 
And then you talk about conscious versus subconscious. When you get in New Testament territory, it's spirit, soul, and body. I remember, this name may be lost in you, but there was a great uh, Pentecostal general named Lester Sumrall. I don't know if that name uh, rings a bell with anybody. I did some meetings with him back in the 70s, and he was um, kind of amazing. And uh, I asked him one day, I said, Dr. Sumrall, what's the... What's could you define the difference between the spirit and the soul to me? And he said, Son, your soul's in your head and your belly, your spirit's in your belly. And like he walked off. I said, Oh, well, I, 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 there you have it. I didn't know it was that simple. I was waiting for a little bit more of an exposition, but he nearly seemed aggravated that I asked him, you know. And I thought, Well, I have you alone. One thing I've learned about, and people may say the same thing about me, a lot of these guys that we, I used to have in, you put a microphone in their hand, they were fantastic then after they were off they were off I mean they weren't even good at small talk and I think some people I think any of you that have ever had lunch with me after a service know that I'm really not good at conversation I just kind of sit there and look at it because I've been talking for the last hour (laughs) so there's that but anyway um so I want to say before I read you this next thing um, when we talk about conscious versus subconscious, uh, even if you ever read after uh, E.W. Kenyon, who uh, I, I always loved his writings back in the 40s, uh, he, he talked about the spirit of man being the subconscious. Now, what's interesting, I don't know if any of y'all have the Caboris manuscript. I know uh, uh, Wellington's got a copy of it. But one thing, it, I mean, it's very heady, the... the uh, in the introduction explaining really nuanced things about language, whatever. But one thing the Kaboris shows is that the ancients actually understood the subconscious more than modern people realize that they did. It's it kind of gets lost in Western, like the when the when the um, the Bible w- was sort of sanitized by European consciousness. Uh, a lot of that Eastern mystical side of God was lost because the Europeans weren't as mystical. And then when you come to American Christianity, kind of created this whole other thing that's not even really similar to what Jesus taught. Jesus was Eastern. He was mystical. Um, So when he talked about things, people understood allegory. They understood... uh, you know, uh, even and when I say myth, I'm not saying the Bible's not true, but there are there's mythology that is about teaching truths, not about the literalness of it. Like, for instance, I've shared this with you before, but for the sake of the podcast, um, the Noah story is a great story because in that story, it's basically saying one man can make a difference. Because in the in the Noah story, God comes to Noah and he says. I'm sick of the world, I'm going to destroy it, but you can save it. So the Noah story is a precursor to Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you know, some of these people who took it on themselves to sort of change consciousness. If you get literal about where there are really two kangaroos and two zebras, and, and they've even got this, where is it, in Ohio now, they've, they've recreated the ark, and you can go through it, and 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 uh, and the thing is, if I were up there, I w- I would you know it'd be interesting to see their vision of it. I've even read books where you know creationists who think the Earth is only six thousand years old think that dinosaurs were on the Ark and stuff. I'm like, oh come on now, come on. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, but it takes thousands of years for the uh, Colorado River to cut through that rock, and it's really I mean, I posted some pictures last week of, I remember sitting on the precipice, and it's, somebody did fall off there just the other day, taking a picture. A lot of these people in, taking selfies will back up, and then, you know, and I was, I was sitting, if you see on the, I'm looking at going, take the picture, take the picture. Mm. Um, but when you look at that, you think, th- this would take millions and millions of years for something like this to happen. It doesn't mean that God didn't create it. It just means that if Moses was here, he would say to us, no, I would, when I talked about the earth being created in six days, I was being poetic. I, I wasn't there either. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm explaining. It's a, if, if you understand how a man like Moses would have thought, 
It's a very poetic way. It's not supposed to be textbook taught that, um, you know, there was nothing here 6,000 years ago and then God spoke it all into existence. That's, it's ludicrous. And you can still believe that God created it. You can still believe in intelligent design and still know that scientists do know what they're talking about. Anyway, you all know that, but I like when I say these things, I like to put it in this context. Now, having said that, back to the Kaboris manuscript. If you don't know what the Kaboris is, it's it's um, it's part of a um, of a um, Aramaic Bible, which is what G the the language that Jesus spoke. And they they only the the only original one they have is somewhere in Turkey, but the what what you have in book form now is some passages from. Matthew and some passages from John. So there's not there's not even a full New Testament. But there's enough in there that you can see by the way they talked they used the words for life that they they had a concept of a hidden life an internal world all that kind of stuff that you know you come along to the last century and everybody thought Sigmund Freud discovered the subconscious. But when you find out the ancients really they didn't know what to call it but they knew that there was something even when when um, when David would say things like, "Who can understand his errors? Uh, cleanse me from secret faults." He was saying, "There's something in my subconscious that's making me do things that I don't understand why I do them. I can't." And Paul comes along in the New Testament and says, "The things I would do, I find myself not doing, and vice versa." So what he's saying is, there's something more than just the way that I think. Like like for instance, you ever have somebody say something to you and you kind of overreact to it or something really, really hurts you more deeply than it should or angers you more than it should or whatever. And you think, why did that, why did that affect me so much? It's probably because your subconscious is responding in ways that your conscious mind doesn't even understand. Understand? <laughs> so last week when I was talking about this, I, I could have just sworn this was a word from God, but I may have read this in a book now that I, because, because I remember Doc, Martin gave me some books by uh, Neville Goddard, and he, he apparently had said that the subconscious was female and the conscious was male. I don't remember ever reading that. And I, you know, when it comes to hearing something from God, I'm, I want to be as clear and honest about that. For whatever and whoever God is, I don't want to ever stand before him, her, it, whatever, whoever God is. I don't want a God to say to me, remember that time you said I said so and so? I never said that. I'm like, wow, that would really be bad. So I like to give lots of disclaimers and say, this is what I think, this is what I heard. You all still with me? That's why a lot of times I will say, the voice in me said, because of this or that or whatever. So I, this is a little lengthy, but just bear with me here, because this is what I found that, if, if you've never read Neville Goddard, he was, um, he's kind of a new thought teacher, but he, he really uh, bridged the gap between the scriptures and some of the things that we know, know about know about imagination, creativity, and that sort of thing. Y'all still with me? Yeah. All right, let me show you what he says. Uh, the conscious is personal and selective. The subconscious is impersonal and non-selective. The conscious is the realm of effect, and the subconscious is the realm of cause. These two aspects are the male and female divisions of consciousness. What? The conscious is male, the subconscious is female. I could have sworn I got that straight from the source. I don't remember that I read that before, but I've just... The conscious generates ideas and impresses these ideas on the subconscious. The subconscious receives ideas and gives form and expression to them. By this law, first conceiving an idea and then impressing the idea conceived on the conscious, all things evolve out of consciousness. Remember that last week I talked about if you, if you take the male-female model of, of uh, conception, you could even go so far as to say that the conscious impregnates the subconscious. And there are certain thoughts. I'll tell you, uh, um, have you ever had a, many times they think that dreams come out of our subconscious. Have you ever dreamt about somebody and you think, why did I dream about them? And then you'll remember, oh, you know what, I'm I thought about them earlier in the day. It's because your conscience didn't sort of register with it and just sort of impregnated the subconscious with it. And then it comes out in dreams. And one reason, I'm not saying dreams can't be 
prophetic because they can be. I'm not really a dream interpreter, so I, that's, that's kind of not my, my area. But there are books that are written on it. However, um, I have heard people say that your subconscious, when you have a dream, kind of acts like a director in a movie. And that's why sometimes you'll be having a dream and you're like, I dreamt that I was washing my car, and then suddenly my third grade teacher, Miss Shelnut, was talking to me about, and you think, that doesn't even make sense. It's because you must have had some thought about her sometime within the last, I don't know, 24, 48 hours, and your subconscious is still trying to figure out what to do with her. So, you know, you're, you're, you're dreaming, I'm washing my car, and the subconscious says, put Miss Shelnut in there. That was, that was my third grade teacher. I didn't uh, put Michelle in there because we got to do something with her. We, the subconscious has been impregnated with this thought, and now is giving birth to this dream. Makes sense, right? That's why sometimes you can't overthink your dreams because sometimes it may be like, is God trying to tell me something? No, it may be just some sort of casual thought that you had that sort of got lodged in your subconscious, and it and it comes back uh, in dream form because when you're dreaming, your conscious mind is turned off. And your subconscious is sort of free to run around the house like Tom Cruise, <laughs> sliding around in his underwear on, with his socks in uh, risky business. Um, by this law, first conceiving an idea and then impressing the idea conceived on the subconscious, all things evolve out of consciousness. And without this sequence, there is not anything made that is made. Now, even back in the day when I didn't use words like this, I still kind of taught along these lines. Because I would say, I, back then I would use the term soul and spirit or mind and spirit more. But I would say, you know, be careful what your mind thinks because it's going to impregnate your spirit with something. And I would even use terminology like don't let your, uh, you know, don't let yourself, I don't want to use the word rape, but it's a cohabit with negative thoughts that are going to, create something uh, that you don't want. And so I even, back in the day, used to talk about the spirit being like a womb, the womb of the spirit, and that you give birth to things. And, and even, you know, when Jesus would say things like, out of the belly flows river, rivers of living water, there's a lot of um, uh, birth imagery, like water breaking before a woman gives birth, that sort of thing. When you really look in, uh, there, there's so much, if you just understand about conception and birth and all that kind of stuff, you, a lot of theology will make sense to you. Which is why we have to acknowledge the female part of God as much as the male part of God. Because in ancient times, patriarchal societies didn't think that women, you know, they didn't understand that when you, when you have a baby with somebody, a, a person is made up of 46 chromosomes, and 23 are from the bio dad, and 23 are from the bio mom. The ancient people didn't realize that. That's why you would say things like, she gave him a son. She bore him a son. She had his baby. No, you have your baby. Like there, it's, it's both of you together in that person, which is where a lot of misogyny came from, because the idea was that sperm was seed that was planted in the ground, and that's why women, frankly, were treated like dirt. You just planted a seed in them, and they give you they would give you offspring. Now we know from biology, no, with it, you know, the the feminine is just as much a part of the masculine in even the biological creation. Y'all with me? I'm not going to make you. When I went to see Joe Dispenza, he made he would say something, and then he would make you repeat it to the person next to you. And after about an hour of that, it gets a little tedious. I was sitting next to a woman from Austria, and we finally just got to where we were like, yeah, what he said. Because I couldn't, I could not look her in the eyes and say that stuff one more time. But, but I do realize when you're talking about heady things, it's easy to get, believe me, I know, because I get easily saturated. Many of you who have spoken to me one-on-one -on -one, I know people that will be talking to me and go, oh, my God, did you just glaze over? I'm like, a little bit. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to say with you, it's, it's me. It's not you. It's not, it's just my, <laughs> my, sometimes I'll be, you'll be talking to me, and I get up and leave the table mentally and walk around and come back. Oh, wow, you're still talking about that. Okay, let me try to catch, <laughs> let me catch up where we were in that conversation because I got, <laughs> I get easily, saturated and y'all just have to love me anyway um you know it's true the conscious impresses the subconscious while subconscious expresses all that is impressed upon it 
The subconscious does not originate ideas, but accepts as true those which the conscious mind feels to be true, and in a way known only to itself, objectifies the accepted ideas. Now, if you listen to some of these teachers, especially like Dr. Dispenza, he talks about when you visualize something that you want to happen, imagine what you would feel like if that thing manifested. Well, that's Mark eleven twenty four. That's believe you receive when you pray. That's uh, that's uh, Judah going out before the army and and rejoicing before the battle was won. I mean, that's we learned all that stuff in faith. As you go ahead and rejoice before the manifestation. Um, well, now we see some of these teachers have connected the dots for us, and that's that's what calling those things which are not as though they are means. All right. It says, uh, therefore, through his power to imagine and feel and his freedom to choose the idea he will entertain, man has control over creation. Control of the subconscious is accomplished through control of your ideas and feelings. In other words, you know, I used to hear a lot of faith teachers talk about, I'm not moved by what I feel, I'm not moved by what I feel. And I understand what they were saying, because they were saying, you know, be steadfast in faith no matter what you feel. However, I think you can teach that on too much of an extreme. Feelings are actually important. Uh, anytime I, I have a, a, a lot of playlists, I have Mahalia Jackson, a lot of playlists, and there's, John Scott does a great cover of this song. Some of y'all sang it, we sang, remember we sang it at Piedmont Park, but uh, my God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. And that's one thing that I, did appreciate it about Pentecostalism is sometimes it was too based on feeling, but you can't take feeling away. I mean, feeling is important. Um, that's all I'll say about that. The, the mechanism of creation is hidden in the very depth of the subconscious, the female aspect or womb of creation. The subconscious transcends reason and is independent of induction. It contemplates a feeling as a fact existing within itself, and on this assumption proceeds to give expression to it. The creative process begins with an idea, and its cycle runs its course as a feeling and ends in a volition to act. Uh, ideas are impressed on the subconscious through the medium of feeling. No idea can be impressed on the subconscious until it is felt, but once felt, be it good, bad, or indifferent, it must be expressed. Y who is it that said, is it Maya Angelou that said people may, may not remember what you said to them, but they'll remember how you made them feel? Wasn't that her quote? And that really is true. Sometimes you don't even have to understand what somebody is saying, but you, I I'll even say this, sometimes somebody can be saying the right thing to you, and it's still, you're like, I don't know why something about what you just said to me makes me feel creepy, and I, I can't explain why. Because it's something that's beyond your, what you're verbalizing. It's something, it's like we communicate on this level, but then we deep cause unto deep. And so sometimes somebody can say something, to, like even um, uh, at Mario's service earlier this week, uh, some of the people who spoke, like Joe, they, they, they uh, spoke in Spanish. I didn't, I don't know enough Spanish to understand everything, but I could kind of get a gist of what they were saying and when they said something funny, I laughed along with it because I, I kind of, knowing Mario enough and knowing some of those anecdotes that I heard him and then hearing them, I could kind of, I could nearly interpret what they were saying. You know what I mean? And the, the way people were responding and laughing and stuff, that transcended language. Um, I've shared this with you a zillion times, but, I re but it makes my point. I remember when my kids were small, having them at, Disney World, and we're sta those lines were crazy. I mean, you'd stand in line for like two hours for, and you know, kids get tired. So you're standing in this line for a ride that you don't want to ride. You're doing it for them, and they're getting all whiny and everything. And I remember in front of me was a Japanese family, and behind me was a, um, a friend. <laughs> she does that story. That felt a little sarcastic. I may not remember what you said, but I, I remember how you made me feel. There was some shade in the French. What are you trying to say? You've heard this story before, Roz? 
Wellington, keep an eye on her, please. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. It was a French family. And I remember as I'm saying the th you know, to the kids, I cannot believe I'm standing in this line. You know, I'm saying the father stuff, like the money we are spending on this thing and all y'all are happy. And I looked at, I could tell the Japanese dad was saying the same thing to his kids. I didn't understand Japanese and I knew a little French, but I did not enough to know what, I knew those fathers were saying the same thing to their kids because at a moment, the three of us looked at each other and went, <sighs> and I was like, I feel you. That is a universal language of exasperated fathers who are also tired and hot and have spent too much money for their ungrateful children. That transcends English and Japanese and French and any other language. I, I feel you. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what he's saying. And then he ends by saying, feeling is the one and only medium through which ideas are conveyed to the subconscious. That's why it's important. <laughs> it's like... Uh, a couple of weeks ago when I did Chandra's mother's service, um, they, they had, she had an incredible organist there who I'm sure, you know, from the black church experience, an organist kind of works in tandem with the minister, not just the whole man. You know, that's, there's, a, there's a whole call and response thing that's fantastic. I wish I could do it. But like, you know, when the guy makes a really good point, the organist, you know, if you've got a good... Even if you're a mediocre preacher, if you've got a good backup, they can make you sound more profound than you actually are. And probably in 47 years of ministering other places, I've probably meet, preached in more black churches than I have white churches. So I'm used to people assuming that I'm going to do that. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had an organist, uh, you know, ready to go. And I'm like, oh, man, I'd love to. You, you guys are incredible, but you're going <laughs> to you're going to throw me off. I can't do it, you know, and. And uh, so I could tell when I started the thing, people were kind of waiting for me to get into that. And I said, by the way, if any of you are waiting for me to get into preaching mode, this is what, this is what I do. This is it. <laughs> like, I'm Larry and Chandra's pastor, so they, they already knew this. But if you're, and they all laughed and got it and loved it. I mean, Larry's exact words were, you were a hit at the funeral. Uh, everybody, everybody loved. But I had to explain to them, I'm communicating something real to you that if I tried to act like something I'm not, it's, it's going to fall flat. I need to tell you I've got to communicate in a way that's real to me. And that's why real recognizes real. I've, learned, I've seen this my whole ministry. Anybody that's pretentious or religious, whatever, it never, never could flow with me because, <laughs> and this is another, I don't know, Roz, what's the story about my neighbor across the street? <laughs> You want to tell that one? I remember one of the first places I lived in Conyers, I invited my neighbor across the street to come to church, and he did come, and he really liked it, and so uh, then I noticed he never came back, and so one day we were both outside, and I said, hey, I, you know, I really love that you came to church. I said, uh, are you, I'd love for you to come back sometime. He said, man, I loved it. I love what you had to say, but he said, God was just too much in that place. It was too much God. And I, I, I mean, I had to process, what, what do you say? Like, isn't that the idea? And I realized what he's saying is, is most people's connection with God is filtered through a lot of unnecessary religious things that people feel comfortable with that really has nothing to do with God. Uh, so there's a way that somebody makes you feel. It's like, and again, I'm going to tell you another anecdote. But this was a few months ago, and it, it, it seems like a simple thing, but it really taught me something. I kept having chest pains, and uh, and enough so that Ken said, should we be concerned? I said, no, I, it's probably indigestion. I'm sure my heart's fine or whatever. And uh, so he, he didn't pray a religious prayer. He came over to my chair, and he said, now, Jesus... I'm going to need you to take this pain out of Jim's chest. Well, it left. And I, it was a better prayer than if Catherine Kuhlman had prayed it for me because it was from someone who has a connection with me who spoke like he actually speaks and is not pretentious about it. Um, and so my point is, uh, what, 
Eddie's a great example of that. It, when it, I read a lot of things that Eddie posts, he writes like he talks. And that's why it sounds real, because you can hear his voice in it. Voice conveys feeling, and feeling is what goes into the subconscious. I know that I've gone to hear some teachers before that I think, you know, I, li I like what something about what you're saying. It's like Mary and Elizabeth. You're making the baby leap in my womb, but my brain is a little confused with what you're saying. But I like the way, I like the way this is making me feel. So I'm going to just go ahead. In a way, it's like, um, you know, we just ran the peach tree again, and I've learned, I mean, I run, walk it now. There was a day I used to run the whole thing. But I've done it 30 times, so so there you have it. But I remember, I don't know how to explain this, but there's a way to run from the waist down or from the waist up. And you can nearly shift. Like, there's a way where you draw most of your energy out of your legs, and there's another way that you sort of change the gears and draw your energy, like, out of your diaphragm and whatever. And I I've learned sometimes when you hear somebody say something, you might not fully understand cognitively, cognitively what they're saying, but they're communicating something to you that is very real because you feel it. Um, there's nothing better than a heartfelt interaction with somebody. When somebody says something to you like, wow, I really felt that. Um, you know, my dad and I have had a, an unusual relationship over the years. And one thing about when someone enters dementia, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of goodbye you go through them because there are certain conversations you thought you were going to be able to have with them that you realize, well, that window's over. I, I, I'm not going to be able to, We'll have to wait till we get to the other side to talk about those things. But with all of his limitations and all of our challenges, I will say this, that there have been many times when I needed him to come through, he would say something that really, it's like I felt it. Part of it was starting Metron, you know, when I was trying to stay in Conyers and, and uh, you know, I was these staff had been faithful to me, so I was trying to keep that open so they all have jobs. I mean, I'm just telling you, that's really what it was about. And I was so stressed out and confused and was going to the emergency room and, you know, was having migraines and all kind of stuff. And um, this is when he was still fully functioning. And we went over there one day and I said, Look, I just need you to tell me what to do. Because, I, I, I mean, I need you to, I need you just to be a dad right now. And tell me, what do I need to do? And he said, go do what you want to do. He said, they're going to be fine. He named everybody on staff that he knew. They'll be fine. They'll be fine. And sure enough, they are fine. They never came here one time. So he, you know, with all the hand wringing, people are like, what are we going to do without hearing your voice? I guess you've done just fine. It's been five years. You never came once. So I guess you figured it out. And something about when he said that, I felt the energy. It's like, wow, I really needed that. Thank you. Thank you for saying that to me. And then I remember him saying to me one time uh, when so much transition was happening in my ministry, he said, look, you're going to be fine because you have to be fine. And I'm, there's a, my inner child is scared of him enough that it's like, oh, my dad told me I have to be fine, so I guess i got to be fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I felt that when he said you have to do this, I was like, oh, well, I can't fail because my dad said I couldn't fail. I mean, it really was like that. Like I felt the energy of that. And that's why sometimes um, we don't realize how much feelings have affected our subconscious and sometimes for the negative because remember what I told you last week I'm not going to tell you again but about the thing that happened with Olivia on the playground and then later in the day I said Olivia what is going on and she's I don't know I thought, well that's that's what happens with the subconscious a ne that's why if you don't deal with something negative that's said to you uh, it's it's going to go somewhere you're either going to need to forgive it or confront it, or something, because if you just ignore it, it's going to go somewhere, and it's most likely going to end up in your subconscious, and it's going to affect uh, your real life. I remember counseling with a guy one time, sharp guy, seemed to really have it together, but he'd had like 13 jobs in one year, and he just could not keep a job, and every job he went to, 
the same thing would happen over and over again. And I'm, I'm talking to this guy, thinking, why are you having such, I mean, you look hireable, you, you're smart, you're articulate, you, you, you're educated, whatever. And in our talking, he said, um, he said, my dad always told me I was, underachie- I was an underachiever, and I was never going to amount to anything. I thought, oh, well, there you have it. You're, you're obeying your father. You know, you were, you're feeling the effect of those words um, because there was a negative feeling that came with it. Because words have vibrations on them. A word contains a feeling. And so, so when somebody says a word to you that feels a certain way, you ingest that feeling. And it goes somewhere. Um. Look, there's some things that can't be talked out. I have learned this. There's some, th- some people just have a certain view of a thing that happened, and there's not enough talking in the world. There's not enough come-to-Jesus moments in the world to get it straightened out. I mean, th- I understand why the Scripture says a brother offended. It's harder to be one than it is to take a city. So some things you're just going to have to resolve within yourself, but you do have to deal with it. Like this thing that was said to me, I've got to process it, because I think it's gone somewhere in my subconscious and it's affecting my, con- it's like the conscious has impregnated the subconscious and the subconscious is giving birth to things that I don't like. And let me tell you, if you're going to follow this womb metaphor, the subconscious can keep pushing out babies. It never goes through menopause. It could just keep pushing out babies. I mean, you can't believe it's like the subconscious. <laughs> The subconscious, don't think of it in human terms. Think of it like some animal that has litters. And <laughs> like there's a feral cat that lives around my mom's house, and mom gets attached to the kittens, and then she gets upset because they move away. And mom, I always say, mom, she'll be back. She'll be pregnant next week. I mean, you know, look at her. She's got lipstick on right now. She's going to a party. <laughs> and sure enough, like every few days, there's a, a fresh batch of kittens around. That's what, you know, that's what. What they do, that's the way your subconscious is. It's giving birth constantly. Anything that's going on in your life that you don't understand, why am I doing this? Why, why is this happening? It's, it's because the subconscious is the hard drive of your life much more than you realize. Because you can say the right thing out of the conscious, but the subconscious communicates feelings. That's the energy. And people are, I mean, feelings are contagious. You know? Uh, have, don't you know people in your life that as soon as, you, as soon as you see them, you feel better? And there's other people that when you see that name come up on your phone, you're like, oh, crap. This isn't going to be good. <laughs> I gotta, I'll take this later, but I got to, I'm going to have to sit down. I'm going to have to have a drink or something before I talk to them because this is never good. <laughs> and sometimes you get in a weird stronghold thing with somebody it's because you're expecting it not to be good that you, you start drawing it out. Have you ever been around somebody that you act differently around them and you're like, why, do, why am I acting? It's because they're pulling out some kind of energy in you. I mean, that's what happened when Jesus went to his hometown. He could do no mighty miracles because they didn't see him the way that everybody else saw him. Is this not Joseph the carpenter's son? And immediately it tapped into his humanity. And and for a moment he's like, yeah, I guess I am Joseph the carpenter's son. I mean, that's really what what was happening. So when you're around people who are receptive to your gifts, you end up being more giving. Um, There's other people you don't even realize how you clench up around them emotionally and, and put your defenses up because you just don't know like this this could be painful or this could be whatever or judgmental or, or whatever always listen uh, to the thing that somebody says uh, like I, I was hearing some commentators talk about the the Democratic debate when Kamala Harris said to Joe Biden she says I don't think you're a racist but Because the person said, when you say that, what you're saying is, I think you're a racist. Like, that's what disclaimers are. It's like when somebody, if if somebody ever says to you, no, I'm just saying this in love, run. Because you're about to hear the most unloving thing you have ever heard. 
Because they, if they really loved you, they wouldn't have to preface it with, I'm just saying this in love. And, of course, my favorite is when I don't get so many of these anymore, but when somebody would send me a letter, it's not my place to judge you, and then have five pages of judgment. Like, well, then, <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's never going to be good. Why don't you just end it with, dear so-and-so, it's not my place to judge you, sincerely. Like, now that's a good letter. <laughs> But people feel like, well, if I give you this disclaimer, that being said, now I can say this. Don't go with that. Go with the feeling of when somebody just loves you honestly, they can just say their thing to you, and you know, oh, you're saying this, you're saying this in love. Um, I'm kind of experiencing this with because uh, I'm writing these articles for Back Row Planet, and I'm you know I've known my friend Howie since we were 17, and I. Avery can tell you, I don't like to collaborate. Like, I, I used to have people on staff proofread my books, but I liked them as they were. I had some people that worked for me that would say, I think this would sound better if so-and-so. Would you like to change it? And I'd be like, mm -mm, I liked it like this. And on some things, they would wear me down. And be, I would change it. And then when the book actually came out, I'd be like, oh, I wish I'd kept it the way it was because I like. Always go with your instincts. And, uh, but with Howie, I, I sent the articles to him because he has to put them in the format. And he knows me well enough to say, are you cool if I tweak a couple of things? And I'm like, well, it is his blog. So I said, and he's a teacher. So I'm like, yeah, it's fine. He's, he's, I said, you know what I sound like anyway. And so and not a lot of changes, but there's a couple of things he tweaked. And when I read it, I think, Huh, that actually does sound better. Okay, I finally found the one person in the world I can collaborate with. At least on his. Now, if he was calling me about my books, I'd be like, I think somebody needs to back off is what I think. But that is, <laughs> that is his territory. But um, what was the point of that? Oh, the point is about words have meanings and a vibration and there's a way that you want to communicate and uh, anyway, I think I've made that point. Let me show you some of um, these uh, quotes, and then we'll meditate. This is by T.F. Hodge. It says, deep within there is something profoundly known, not consciously but subconsciously, a quiet truth that is not a version of something but an original knowing. What this absolute truth or identity is may be none of our business, but it is there guiding us along the path of greater becoming, a true awareness. It is so self-sustaining that our recognition of it is not required. We are offsprings of such a powerfully divine force, creator of all things known and unknown. What it's saying is, is there's basically saying that your subconscious can interpret God in a way many times that your conscious can't. And um, really, you know, David was a, uh, a songwriter. The Psalms are lyrics to songs. And when you see the Hebrew word selah, S-E-L-A-H, it, it's actually, a, um, it means a musical interlude. It means I've, you've sung these lyrics, now let the music play. And it, like in the Amplified Bible, it interprets it as pause and calmly think of that. In other words, there are things that this song is saying to you that you can't even understand with your mind. Um, it's different people that would write in the scriptures would talk about unutterable words, words that cannot be uttered. Paul talked about groanings that cannot be uttered because they're they're communicated in feelings. You can you can feel the presence of God. Uh, you can go into a place and feel like I feel the atm I like the atmosphere here. I feel the atmosphere here. Now sometimes you have to go in places where you don't like the atmosphere, and then you have to you have to be the one to change it. Sometimes it's not realistic to always go into friendly environments. So sometimes you have to be the thermostat and not the thermometer. But there is something about, I like, i tell you this, if, if you want to know, should I marry this person or not marry this person? How do you feel when you're with them? Because if you're uh, going to spend the majority of your life with somebody, you better like the way, and I'm not talking about romance or sex. I'm, I'm talking about something deeper than that. It's just... Being around you makes me feel a certain way. You better have that. 
Because if you don't, it'd be so much better to be single. Seriously. If you don't find, and I mean to the extreme, like if I never find that for the rest of my life, it's not worth it. Security's not worth it. Not, I mean, I can figure it out by myself. But if I don't feel right, I can't live with you. You've got, am I, I got BJ shouting back there. <laughs> BJ's going to run the aisles, put your church hat on first before you do. You don't run these aisles without putting that church hat on. No, but that's true, and that's, I mean, honestly, I feel that way about everything. I mean, maybe this is too simplistic, but if you hate the way you feel on your job, get another job. You can't, you're going to spend the majority of your life working somewhere, and sometimes that's not always practical. Sometimes you have to, you know, stick it out at a place or whatever, but you should generally like the way, I mean, come on, Jesus had 12 disciples and spent the majority of his time with three of them. There must have been a way that he felt with Peter, James, and John that he didn't feel with the other nine and still used them. They worked with him, but you just, it's whether you call it chemistry or whatever, you need to like, you need to like where you live. You need to like where you go to church, where you go to school, whatever. I mean, as much as you can, even if you don't like the way it is now, your goal should be, I need to move it to where, especially as you get old. Let me tell you something about aging. The older you get, the more um, you become a steward of your time. Do you know what I mean? When you're 21, you have infinite time. When you get to a certain age, you realize, oh, well, this life does come to an end at a certain point. So for whatever time I have left, it needs to be, I need to do stuff that I enjoy doing. I, ne- I don't have time. A day becomes too precious I don't have time to waste days on doing stuff that I don't like. And you can just learn as you get older that no is a complete sentence. You don't have to explain everything. You can just say, you don't have to worry like, is, am I hurt their feelings? No, just say, I don't, that doesn't sound like something I'd like to do. And you're, it's not the end of the world. And um, th- that should be, I mean, I'm not saying you should become grumpy old men. I'm saying you should get to a place where you know I like the way this thing makes me feel, and if it if it doesn't feel a certain way, remember this. Even something as simple as when you go shopping, you're going shopping for something. You got to you have an event. You got to wear. If you don't like the way you feel in it, don't buy it. I don't care how much that person trying to sell you that goes. Oh, you look amazing in that. No, if you don't like the way you feel, you're gonna get home and you're gonna say, Why did I buy this? I don't like the way it made me feel. And I used to, when I used to mentor young ministers, you know what I would tell them? Some of these guys that hadn't preached very much would put so much time into studying their outline that I would say to them, I'd say, look, it's, being prepared is great, but let me tell you some basic things. If you don't just kind of feel good about what you're saying, all the study in the world, it's, it's not going to translate. You could nearly be a little unprepared, and if you feel good, if you feel excited, about what you're doing, that's what's going to translate. Um, so I would say, like, you know, this may sound superficial, but make sure that you got plenty of rest before you speak. Uh, make sure you feel comfortable in what you're wearing. Like, if you if you feel like you put on a few extra pounds, don't wear something tight, because you're going to, believe me, I know what it's like to go, oh, is it an orange jacket? Because it, it affects the way that you feel. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you if you feel good about something, you can take even a mediocre, what would be a mediocre message, and it's it's the it's the feeling that goes with it. They're like, oh yeah, I liked what that guy said. There's there's a feeling to it. Um, this next one is uh, Jenny Davidow says. Um, Your subconscious is a powerful and mysterious force which can either hold you back or help you move forward. Without its cooperation, your best goals will go unrealized. With its help, you are unbeatable. That's why, you know what, if I had to tell you, if if somebody said in, I would say even more, well, I'd say 47 years of counseling with people. If somebody said, what's the number one constant that's made people feel like they couldn't receive, I would say unworthiness more than anything else. Because I don't care how great the promises of God are, if you don't feel worthy to receive them, 
because you're beating yourself up over something or whatever. I'm telling you, it's you're not gonna re, you're not gonna receive. Um, it's that moment uh, when you realize, oh, this is this is a promise to me. God loves me like I am, not how everybody wants me to be, but I'm fine like I am. That sense of unworthiness, I'm telling you, it affects people on so many levels. Um, If you feel like you deserve good things, guess what? Good things, you magnetize yourself to good things. And that's why uh, I believe in talking it up so much. When something good happens, give a praise report about it because it creates a, um, a momentum, yes. It's like I'm a good thing happened, and I'm talking about a good thing happening, which makes more good things happen. And uh, th- there was w- one day uh, last week, it was just just minor little things. I, I could just tell I was just enough off the groove, out of the groove, that you ever had just one of those days where, like, it's nothing significant enough to even register as a bad day. It's just, eh. and I And I had to consciously say, I don't like the way this day is going because days like this, tend to spiral downward, and this could end up badly. So I had to stop and reboot. All right, I need this day to change. I need the energy of this day to change. I don't like the things that, you know, there's a couple things that were said to me or whatever that I'm carrying with me, and I'm, I'm going to have to put these somewhere because I can tell they're affecting me. And, I mean, I just pulled the car over and, and turned my day off and pushed a start button and restarted it. I mean, really, I like subconscious, I mean, intentionally went, all right, I'm restarting this day. And just something as simple as that, like, oh, there we are. Okay. There's the parking place. There's the thing. There's the, you know, I'm used to that happening. And um, the more you get used to it, the more it happens. All right. How are we going to make the transition into going into meditation? Let me show you this one other thing, and it's... um, uh, just a uh, meme. The soul usually knows what to do to heal itself. The challenge is to silence the mind, which is the th- that's the uh, title is the, the healing the subconscious. Um, meditation doesn't replace prayer. It's a uh, it's an addition to prayer. Uh, meditation is not a Buddhist or a Hindu thing. It's a God thing. Uh, I guarantee you the time that Jesus was off away from his disciples, he wasn't praying the whole time. He was contemplating. He was he was being quiet. David said, you know, you make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside the still waters. There's so many things that people pray about that would just get answered if you would just get quiet. If you would just quiet, get quiet and let your, whether you call it your spirit, it's your subconscious, whatever, let your subconscious speak and, and correct itself. Um, I don't know when it happens, but I know just what little bit of meditation I've done. I can tell th- things have been corrected and that couldn't have been corrected through um, uh, therapy or counseling. or whatever. When you get too cerebral about your problem, I'm not saying therapy can't help. Life coaching can help. Uh, I do it regularly. But it can only take you so far. There really are some things that the, the answers are just within you. And the fewer voices are on the line, the more the more clearer, clearly you're going to be able to hear that. So um, let's do about a maybe the five to ten minute one. If you've never meditated with us, it's you know you don't have to do it, but just stay with us and we'll um, we're going to do this. And we, if you uh, go ahead and start the music, I like to light a candle. I think candles are. They feel spiritual to me. If you just sit up straight, please, and empty your lap. You don't have to close your eyes, but you may want to. And the main thing we're going to focus on is our breathing. In the scriptures, the word ruach in the Hebrew is breath or spirit. In the New Testament, it's pneuma, which is breath or spirit. It's a good thing to breathe in through your nose. 
and then hold it and breathe out through your mouth. So we're going to breathe in. Exhale. Inhale. Life is in the breath. God breathed into Adam. Jesus breathed on his disciples. Just become consistent in your breathing. When you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, you bring nitrous oxide into your body. It oxygenates you. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm going to wean you off my voice. just bring you into a place of healing. Even as you begin to breathe, the stress leaves you. reason why the scripture talks about peace that passes understanding it means it's it comes from somewhere beyond your logic somewhere beyond your conscious mind thoughts that are moving around, it's fine. They'll settle down in a minute. Just let your spirit be quiet. Let your mind be quiet.
those of you who listen to the podcast, just breathe with us. Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching the innermost parts of the belly or the hidden rooms of the heart. The light of God goes into the hidden places, brings healing there. Healing to your mind, healing to your heart, healing to your emotions. back up and when you're ready go ahead and stand that was good that was easy everybody got there quickly go ahead stand I know it feels abrupt to come out of that turn the lights back on <laughs> anybody hear anything in your spirit that you want to speak out anything that was clear to you Karen Everything had happened, and you come out, and everything. I had a dream, and the dream was that you were at the altar with the bride, and you kind of looked at me like, uh, no, no, you know. And um, but I got just now, I got that kind of interpretation. Is 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 
in the dream, the bride had this tree coming out of her hair. And just now, I just saw as with the way with that you're describing the subconscious and the conscious and yes, the female, the female and the male, not the male part and the female part. Yeah. And it's so that you're teaching us how to tap into that part of our female <laughs> brain where we can, I mean, that's what, that's what God's for. Wow, I love that. Yeah. Whew, it gave me chills. Yeah. Wow. Anybody else? Anything you want to share? What you heard in your spirit? Well, thank you for being here. I know a lot of people are gone today, but uh, I'm glad that you're here. I'm especially glad to see you guys. Uh, remain standing for this, and then I'll speak a blessing over you. Did you get anything out of this today? Contributing to Metron is quick and easy. You can give anytime using any smartphone. Text the amount you'd like to donate to 404-620-5044. You will then receive a notification that you successfully completed your donation. You may also visit bishinthenow.com and click the support tab to give there as well. When you contribute to Metron, you're also donating to the charity or organization of the month. Thank you for your investment into Metron. If you have a check, just make it to JESM, and Danny will receive that. If you have cash, just pay it forward and bless somebody. Take somebody to lunch. Or, uh, just pay it forward. Um, remember, two weeks from today, we will not be here. We will be on Jekyll Island. And I think most of you already have your rooms, so it's going to be beautiful. We're expecting perfect weather and signs in the heavens and waters parting. Patricia was there the other day. She said the water's parted. I said, oh, it wasn't just us? I thought, I thought we made that happen. <laughs> um, keep Betty in your prayers, of course. Uh, keep Christine in your prayers. She needs a healing manifestation to finish. And um, you're blessed when you come in, blessed when you go out, blessed in the city, blessed in the country, blessed in the basket, blessed in the store, blessed is the fruit of your body. You're the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. As you bind mercy and truth about your neck, you have favor with God and man. As you keep your mind stayed on him, keeps you in perfect peace. You do have that peace that passes understanding. All things are working together for your good. And you wake up tomorrow saying, this is the day the Lord has enabled me to make. I will rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you. Go in peace. I love you.